Hi, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. I'm Fiona Horsfall. I'm the director of ORTA, and we're hosting this webinar with the library. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Vade Chariath here today. Uh, Dr. Chariath is a, a Vetlison Professor of Earth Sciences, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and director of the Aircraft Center for Earth Studies at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science. He is the founder and former director of the Lab um, Laboratory for Advanced Sensing at NASA, Silicon Valley, and a National Geographic Explorer. Chariath invented NASA MIDAR, uh, fluid lensing, and the first plasma actuated aircraft, and is authoring a new textbook on remote sensing and planetary change. He also discovered an extrasolar planet in high school. Um, in 2021, Chariath was one of the 30 finalists selected for, from over 12,000 applicants for NASA's astronaut candidate, candidate class of 21. Dryath received his PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University. Um, as mentioned during today's webinar, seminar, um, participants can enter their questions in the chat feature on GoToWebinar. Um, if there will be time for questions at the end of Dr. Dryath's talk, um, we will accept those questions and Shannon will pass them on for us. Um, if there's no time to answer questions, uh, there will be a recording and we will try to answer those questions via me email afterwards. And with that, um, welcome Dr. Try. Thank you all so much. And you can hear me okay? I'll assume yes, okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, uh, Katie, Shannon, and Fiona for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, libraries are some of my favorite places on earth. And so I'm glad that there is a, a NOAA library a seminar I can deliver. Uh, Fiona kind of gave most of my background and today I'll talk to you about some of the technologies I've been developing for NASA as well as uh, other places like National Geographic and NOAA to help explore our home planet and take those technologies beyond Earth in the search for life elsewhere. So I am an astronomer oceanographer. I grew up with multiple passions in Southern California. That's me and my pet dog and rat um, trying to do astronomy with something that does not have a lens and me in the very cold waters off of uh, California and Catalina, fascinated by all of the life that's in our oceans. For most of my career, I've been driven by one fundamental question. Are we alone in the universe? And if so, why? <laughs> why haven't we found anything? Uh, in 2014, Hubble revisited this famous image called the Ultra, the, the Deep Field. This is where Hubble Space Telescope turned its gaze uh, at an area of the sky that was quite empty visually and stared at it for a really long time, uh, more than 30 days that you can only do in space. And it revealed in an area of the sky about the quarter the size of the moon a universe just teeming with galaxies and life. Uh, this fascinated me and continues to fascinate me and really motivated my career in astronomy. So I started looking to see if I could find other worlds out there in the universe. And I wanted to use uh, an idea I had, which was uh, this transit method of finding planets. So what you're looking at right now is a video um, of, through a solar telescope, a small solar telescope that you can buy, and Venus transiting our sun in 2012. Venus is the big um, occlusion you see that's moving across the solar disk there in the top. So I set out to build uh, my own instruments and, and cameras um, to see if I could find planets that were transiting other stars in the universe within our galaxy from a distance. So there's a lot of stars in our own galaxy, um, and we think that now most of them have planets, but it's really rare, of course, to find a solar system that is perfectly aligned to ours, such that the planet passes in front of the star and can cause a dip in the amount of light. So I was kind of determined to, to find one, um, but I didn't have access to large telescopes. So um, as a high school student, I was also homeless for a number of years, and I spent most of that, my time doing coursework remotely from my high school and living on top of a mountain, um, kind of iterating on the technologies that I developed. And then uh, back in 2003, I successfully uh, detected an extrasolar planet about one and a half times the size of Jupiter, 150 light years away. And it kind of catapulted me onto a path of higher education and learning what physics and astronomy really can can do for our understanding of our place in the universe. So I went to Moscow State University in Russia 
Uh, I wanted to become a good astronaut candidate by speaking Russian. Uh, that's my subway dog, Misha, there, one of my math professors who was very patient with me. Um, I was there for about five years. I also worked as a fashion photographer for Vogue to help pay the bills. So that was uh, Naomi Campbell, one of my <laughs> nicer models. Um, and then after leaving Russia in 2009, I moved to Stanford where I started kind of going back to developing technologies to image things in the cosmos. So I, I first was in uh, astrophysics and, and physics, theoretical physics, trying to understand everything from the large scale structure of the universe down to small scale, how do single particles work? You know, how do we, how, what is the universe made up of on large scales? And I got back into planet detection. So that's that solar telescope again. And I wanted to come up with a method within our own celestial backyard, our solar system, of imaging objects at very high resolution. So I started revisiting uh, imaging the sun, and in this case, the Venus transit. Here you can see the effect that our atmosphere has on the sun and that, and that planet transiting. So all the movement you see in this image is not coming from the telescope, it's actually from our atmosphere, which causes this blurring and scintillation effect, atmospheric seeing. So actually when you are looking at stars from Earth on the ground and you look up at the sky and they appear to twinkle, they're not physically twinkling or changing brightness, but the atmosphere is causing these distortions along your line of sight, which is one of the reasons why we send up space observatories to look at things from beyond. So I wanted to develop a technique that could be used on the ground to image these objects, and that became known as atmospheric lensing and was the precursor to a technology I'll show today called fluid lensing, wherein we can create very high resolution images in the past of celestial objects. This is my image of the sun in 2012. Uh, that rivaled that of large space observatories like the Solar Dynamics Observatory in orbit. So when I presented this at, at NASA, I got hired on the spot um, at NASA Silicon Valley and kind of got my dream job, which was to work at NASA uh, directing a lab and inventing new technologies for the agency. Uh, that culminated most recently in 2021, where I was uh, one of the 30 finalists for the astronaut class then. And it's just been a, a really fun ride, and I'm incredibly grateful for all of the, the colleagues and mentors I had on the way that, that got me there. But in this pursuit of, of looking at space and trying to understand the universe's structure at large and life, um, this nagging thing kept bothering me <laughs> as somebody who also loved the ocean is that we've mapped now more of the surface of Mars, the sun, and the moon than we have of our home planet, uh, the majority of which is, is aquatic, right, is underwater. Um, as of 2023, we're still at a stubborn five to six percent of our sea floor mapped at the same resolution as we have mapped the moon and Mars. Um, this is really startling to me for a number of reasons, but primarily because it means we do not fully understand the diversity of life on our home world. And 99% of the habitable volume of our planet is in the water. It's not on land. We're sort of these exceptional monkeys. So if you're trying to look in the universe for life and you're doing so with these blinders on of this is you know, one example of how to search for it, you're not gonna find what is in fact the most abundant form of life, which is oceanic. So I'm trying to um, take technologies for exploring our home world and conserving it at a critical time in its evolution and applying that to looking for life elsewhere in the universe. Um, we've hit the celestial jackpot in many ways because we now know of multiple ocean worlds in our celestial backyard. Uh, these are worlds like Titan, a moon of Saturn, which you can actually see with a small telescope. That's in the um, top middle there. That's an infrared view of it. You can actually see sunlight glinting off of methane, hydrocarbon lakes and seas. I mean, if that doesn't give you chills, I don't know what does. Um, in the bottom right, Enceladus, another amazing uh, ocean world of Saturn. You can see tiger stripes, these, these big striations on the bottom left of that icy moon, which are actually cryovolcanic eruptions. Uh, they're spewing out ice crystals into what we now think populates Saturn's rings. And in the case of Europa on the top right, we think that there is a, a, a subglacial, uh, it's basically under ice uh, ocean that is larger than Earth's ocean on a moon you know, around Jupiter. So there's multiple targets, I think, within our celestial backyard for finding life. But to kind of understand those, we first have to turn our gaze towards our home planet. And what I really want to motivate in this talk and in everything I do for my career and hopefully inspire up some of the young folks on the line is that oceanography you know, needed its Hubble Space Telescope moment a few decades ago. It now needs its Webb Space Telescope moment. It has never gotten one. 
And what's surprising is astronomy for all of the wonder it gives us, it has very little immediate bearing on the climate crisis and, and how we are addressing life on Earth. Right? There's one thing to go and, and look for life in the universe, but then the question always comes up to my mind, what do you do once you've found it? Do you treat it the same way we have the diversity of life on our home world? Because if so, that's really a, a terrible thing and we should be trying to pivot some of the knowledge we're gaining from the universe to applying it on what is perhaps the most precious example of life anywhere that we've looked and we've looked extensively for it, um, which is in our ocean. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of a multi-billion dollar space observatory that has trained its eyes on the sea and is focused on trying to fill in that knowledge gap from five to six percent of our world mapped to the majority of our planet mapped. So after 10 years I was at NASA working on a lot of these technologies I'll share today and most recently moved to University of Miami where I'm doing almost exactly the same work for NASA, but with a larger team and I get the opportunity to work closer with NOAA colleagues as well as students and inspire that next generation. This is some of my team. Uh, my student made this poster you see on the right. And we have a great time um, both developing instruments, doing field work and processing data. So I direct something now called the Aircraft Center for Earth Studies. And I have four main um, kind of uh, fields of expertise that we're growing. One is in sensors. I'll share these sensors today with you that are targeting uh, the ocean, fluid chem and MIDAR. The second is aeronautics. Um, this is really just those sensors need to survey large areas. And the best way to do that right now at scale is aircraft systems and satellite systems, as well as um, vessels on the water. The third component is a CubeSat program uh, at NASA. We helped pioneer these small satellites, which are now kind of buzzing in low Earth orbit. Uh, we want to continue responsibly um, developing technologies to survey our home world from the vantage point of space. It really gives you fast access and long duration access to imaging our home world. And then the final component is an AI component, a compute component, where we are taking all the data from these instruments and feeding them into uh, machines to give us answers about the ecosystem at large. So why the shift from astronomy to oceans and, and what's similar and why, why can't we see the seafloor? Um, so if we look at a satellite picture from space, this is a, a very high resolution commercial satellite called Worldview 3. And this is an image of an area that I spent a lot of time working in. It's a coral reef um, off of the coast of Guam in Tumon Bay. And here you can immediately see one of the problems is the Earth's atmosphere and the ocean do not transmit light very well. So light from the sun, um, particularly the weightier wavelengths of light, it goes through our atmosphere as if it's not there. So naturally, we use radio waves to do a lot of communications, GPS, uh, radio observations of, of satellites and other things with radar. But in the water, everything to the right of red is absorbed, <laughs> and everything to the left of ultraviolet is absorbed. So really, you're just left with this narrow band of light from about 380 nanometers, so UV or blue, to red in the 720 nanometers near infrared wavelengths that light penetrates in water. Um, after about 100 meters depth, you know, most light is extinguished from the sun. And right now, light is the best way, I think, of surveying large areas on a different planet or our home planet because it comes abundantly from the sun and tells you a lot of information about a system. The second challenge we have with remote sensing of aquatic systems is ocean waves. Now this is something that you learn about very early on in schooling, right? Light travels at different speeds depending on the medium it's traveling in. In vacuum, it travels at sea, the speed of light, but in different media, it changes its velocity. And as a result, when it encounters something like it goes between air and water in the ocean, um, it can get bent or refracted. And this issue is, is occurs even if the ocean is completely flat, which I can attest to it never is. Um, and it causes our satellites and aircraft when they're looking at something out of underwater to incorrectly place it and size it. It's hard to look at an object through time accurately. When you add waves to it, which the ocean always has, now the problem compounds and you get very large distortions that can limit the resolution of your sensor, even if it's capable of seeing something on land at very high resolution, in the water it cannot. And this is partly why we have such difficulty mapping the seafloor, it's just that it's hard to look through because it attenuates light. And then the second challenge is that it bends light in a way that on land occurs less. 
So I set out in my PhD at Stanford to try to understand this phenomenon. I call it fluid lensing, and I created lots of simulations um, of this phenomena on a NASA supercomputer. Here you can see a number of test targets at a depth of about five meters and ocean waves moving over them with sunlight. And what you'll notice are two phenomena that I use in fluid lensing to achieve very high resolution and actually exploit. The first is when a wave passes over an object, if it has the right shape, namely it's curved the right way, it can magnify that object. And you'll see that as you get deeper in this pool, waves are periodically magnifying and demagnifying the object. The second phenomena are the formation of these bright bands of light or caustics. And you can see them kind of dancing on the seafloor. You'll see them in a swimming pool. These are actually rays of sunlight that have been focused at a certain point in the water from the same waves that are causing those magnification events. And they can actually be brighter than the sun at the surface of the water at a depth of four meters. So next time you go swimming underwater, just you know make sure you wear your sunscreen because you're getting zapped by these massive magnifying lenses <laughs> of light. So that was all in a supercomputer simulation. Now we're trying to apply this um, uh, in the real world and develop a technology to look through it. So this is a drone flying around the coral reef. That's typically how I survey corals. And what fluid lensing does is essentially take the high resolution multispectral video, slow motion video of a region, um, looks at the fluid distortions, characterizes them, and then actively tracks magnification events and caustics to see clearly through uh, ocean wave distortion. So what you're looking at is the before and after of a fluid lensing campaign from a drone um, in American Samoa. And here you can see this image uh, has been validated down to sub-centimeter resolution in 3D. So it's the first remote sensing technology that can reliably look through ocean waves and see things at the sub-centimeter scale. So for objects like coral reefs, there's a sea cucumber going by on the screen if you have a really cute eye. Um, for coral reefs, this is vital because they grow at roughly a centimeter per year. So if you're trying to track changes in the ocean ecosystem, then it is changing the fastest of all the ecosystems we know of on Earth. Um, it, you really need centimeter scale resolution to assess reefs at scale. Um, and then you also need to expand whatever survey area you're looking at to entire islands, right? Functionally, much, much larger um, geomorphological groupings. So I'll share some new results from our 2022 campaign in Guam. I just came back from the 23 campaign um, and then a whale campaign and I'm leaving to Madagascar at the end of this week to do one more coral campaign. But here's an example of something that had vexed me for quite some time, um, breaking waves. Uh, this is a, a satellite image at the same time as our campaign in uh, Guam in 2022 over this region called Tumon Bay. One of my collaborators there had been pushing me for really the latter half of a decade to try to develop a way to look through breaking waves. It's not easy to look through breaking waves and I commend anybody who is trying to do this. Um, but right now, fluid lensing can reliably look through them and reveal, uh, in this case, a ton of new types of corals that even many divers and snorkelers have not seen because they're in the surf, right? They're in regions that you don't want to go swimming because you'll get smashed against um, very sharp acropolis. Uh, we're able to do this pretty robustly. Um, there's still some artifacts. So here you can see again the satellite image of a region um, and then the corals that live there. There's a new species of coral that is on that ridge that was not observed before. Again, only really available through airborne technology. And we can go big. We can create you know, full scale uh, maps, uh, 3D images of the entire reef. Uh, in this case, we're looking at Tumon Bay again. And this data set is roughly 150 terabytes in size, but allows us to again get that centimeter scale view of uh, individual coral colonies and then track how they're changing through time. Most recently, we've been deploying some of these technologies at home here. Uh, this was our first mission for NOAA um, through the National Marine Sanctuaries to image Horseshoe Reef, which I was you know, surprised to see when we first surveyed it this earlier this spring was doing fairly well um, and was the site of a lot of active restoration work. And then of course we had a, a marine heat wave uh, this summer. And so my team came back from the Pacific. We did an emergency mission out there to survey it again. And you can see the, the extent of the bleaching that's going on in the corals in this video. Um, these are all online on our data viewer, which I'll share in a moment. So you can go and explore that, that result. 
We're hoping to go back to the same reef um, later this fall and survey whether the bleached coral has either recovered or has been colonized by algae and is functionally dead. But um, this drives home the, the point for technology development like this is we need the ability to respond quickly, right? Aircraft allow you to do that. Um, and also to do in a way that's quantifiable, that we can measure and look at change through time accurately with you know, good georeferencing. Some other developments behind NemoNet are in trying to detect uh, biomass and floating debris. So traditionally, the fluid lensing method deletes everything that moves as a function of the group velocity of a wave. So if there's a fish that's in the coral, which is often <laughs> the case for a healthy reef, those fish often get deleted in the process of fluid lensing. And now we're trying to go back and recover some of those data to show uh, the presence or, or ascertain the biomass of a particular reef. Uh, it's often the detection of keystone you know, species like sharks or parrotfish that you can assess um, the, the health of a, re a reef beyond the bathymetric diversity of corals. So we're trying to develop this technique. It's still very much in the prototype stage, but it's showing a lot of promise for creatures like sharks, sea turtles, uh, things that have a kind of uniform swimming pattern, uh, I guess you could say. All right, so fluid lensing generates, as I mentioned, for one you know, region, um, terabytes upon terabytes of data. And we've done probably north of 60 uh, global field campaigns. So now you might be doing the numbers in your head and realizing there's, there's no real way, even if you survey the entire world at this scale, right? How do you extract information about a particular coral and how it's doing or how an environment is doing? Is it bleaching? Is it not? Has there been a change in the demographics of the reef? You know, have different types of coral taken over? So this was a question that was, you know, in my mind back in 2015 when I first started developing technologies. And I applied for another NASA grant to develop an advanced AI to run on a supercomputer called NemoNet that would try to tackle this problem autonomously. Now, you've heard a lot about AI, especially recently. Um, this is an AI that's really used for just one task, which is let's try to map coral reefs and primarily all the functionally important groups in the shallow marine environment. And very quickly, we learned that you know, even if you have experts training the data, you would need armies of these experts to classify that data, to survey the reef at scale, to train the AI intelligently. And so we decided to pivot and create both the AI on the supercomputer as well as a citizen science video game that empowers everybody, including you on this call, if you've played NemoNet, to help us tackle this challenge of training the AI uh, with user input. So I'll share a short video of how NemoNet works now. NASA NemoNet is a game where you classify the world's coral reefs by painting on real life images scanned from the ocean floor using a revolutionary instrument that lets us see beneath the waves at unprecedented resolutions. Our oceans are so vast, it would take us two million years to classify the world's coral reefs by hand. The classifications you create are sent to our teams of NASA scientists at home base to teach our supercomputer to classify coral reefs on a global scale. Every contribution you make brings us closer to solving this problem. Join the NASA team to help us understand these amazing ecosystems. Take command of your research vessel and learn about all the different types of coral. We must keep the ocean alive. It supports our life as we know it. Together, we can create a global data set of coral reefs and build a better understanding of how to save these aquatic worlds one piece of coral at a time. Good luck and welcome to the NASA NemoNet team. Hopefully you, you played Nivoda. If you have, I thank you because you're part of a, a large group of people. Um, this kind of took off during the pandemic. We didn't intend it to launch during the pandemic, but a lot of folks started playing it um, in multiple countries, mostly landlocked areas, which was quite fascinating. Uh, one of the criticisms we got during launching it during the pandemic, which again was just a you know, virtue of the grant cycle, was why should we care about corals during you know a, a viral pandemic for COVID-19? And we made the prediction that a drug to treat COVID will likely be derived from a coral reef. And sure enough, about six months later, a drug 30 times more effective than Rendezivir was derived from an animal in one of the reefs that we had surveyed. So it goes to show that, you know, we 
we ignore this changing environment and the biodiversity it contains at our peril. If we lose these organisms, which we are on our, on our watch, we are losing out on potential future cures for diseases, but our, our very survival kind of depends on it. So if you're curious to see um, on our data viewer, which is available on the NemoNet website, you can explore um, the actual food lensing data sets, the bathymetry products, uh, as well as some of these prototype habitat maps that NemoNet's been producing with your help. So as you've been helping you know, play the game and classify reefs, I mean, you, know, you go through different trainings to kind of ensure that you're, you're classifying the right things, that then feeds into our computing cluster and we can spit out habitat models with, with increasing accuracy for regions. And now policymakers can go to a website you know, that's very easy to navigate and say, okay, how has this reef changed through time, right? What are the warning signs of things I should be looking for? And how I, as a policymaker, kind of try to affect change in that environment. So we're really excited that this is continuing to develop and we'll be releasing um, some global products later this year from NemoNet and then into the coming years we've got uh, a lot more campaigns feeding data into that uh, global mapping system. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you we need a lot more ocean mapping, um, but you may be astute and notice that fluid lensing and fluid can still work with the sun and sunlight is limited in how far it can penetrate in ocean water. Um, the first 100 meters or so, the photic zone, we call it, of the ocean, um, is, is got sunlight in it, but deeper than that, of course, is quite dark. It's not completely dark. There's still a little bit of actually background during cough radiation and some other sources of light, but it's, all, for all intents and purposes, quite dark, which means that optical sensing in most of the ocean, which has an average depth of about 4,000 meters, um, is very difficult because you have to bring your own light source with you. You can't rely on the sun. And it was probably this limitation that motivated me to think a little bit like some of these creatures that live in the ocean and bring my own light source. And that motivated um, something called the NASA MIDAR instrument, which won NASA's 2019 Invention of the Year. This is an active uh, hyperspectral imaging technology that's a little similar to radar and LIDAR in that it combines a source uh, like a transmitter of narrowband optical uh, illumination with some math. That's the thing that I was for, and then a receiver that measures the reflected light off an object to form a multispectral picture of that object. So instead of using the sun to illuminate um, in all the different colors of light, we actually strategically illuminate an object um, and march through the spectrum in wavelengths that are of particular interest to us. So for example, in the ocean, um, a lot of marine life has pigments and colors that are only in the ultraviolet and blue. And in many ways, we've been looking at the ocean in the wrong way in that we are using eyes that have evolved on land and see in red, green, and blue, we have three main primary color uh, receptors. And everything in the ocean, you know, again, after you get deeper than a few meters, starts getting increasingly less red and less green and it's mostly blue. And so unsurprisingly, a lot of the animals that have evolved to live there and the communication systems, um, their, their colors, they're all expressed in the wavelengths that transmit the furthest, which are in the ultraviolet and blue. And so with MIDAR, we're hoping not only to image objects at all these different colors, but really focus on the colors that the sun doesn't give us much of on um, Earth, mostly because we have an atmosphere that prevents a lot of that light from transmitting. But in the oceans are the light sources that are the, perhaps the most consequential. And that's why I talk about the Webb Space Telescope moment for oceans. Webb looks at light in the universe in the infrared. And a lot of people are, well, why does it look at the infrared? You know, I don't look at the infrared. Snakes look in the infrared. But it's because the universe mostly is in infrared color if you're looking at things that are old. It's very old starlight traveled a long way, stretched out by the expansion of the universe. Its wavelength gets shifted into the infrared. And so Webb was designed from the beginning with that in mind and designed to look at light in the right colors that make sense for the science it's trying to do. And we need to think about the oceans the same way. We can't keep doing the standard red, green, blue because that's how humans evolved. We need to push ourselves to look at the ocean and the colors that the animals that live in it see in. And all of the information that that contains is primarily, again, in that blue and ultraviolet. So MIDAR works on aircraft right now, as well as underwater robots. Uh, here you can see a drone flying uh, MIDAR in Guam. This is slowed down so you can see the MIDAR pulses. 
in each different color. And what this allows us to do is fly over a region. Um, here's an example of a Parietes coral in Guam and illuminate that coral with wavelengths of light that are interesting to us, uh, particularly again, that ultraviolet and blue. And what you'll notice is in the, on the right-hand side of this image, um, it's just showing the coral's reflectance in various colors. It's colored the way that the reflectance is. But in the middle right-hand figure, you'll notice on top of that coral is a very unique pattern that's actually a coral disease that's only visible in these ultraviolet uh, reflectances. And it's things like that that we're trying to detect, preserve, and save environments like coral reefs, but we need to, again, be looking at the right colors to do so. So we're excited that this is progressing further. Uh, most recently, it got two new uh, awards from NASA and National Geographic to develop a next generation sensor. My student, Cam, has been working tirelessly on, on this project. Um, this is called MIDAR-13, so we just machined it. Uh, it. It flew in Guam and most recently in California. And in addition to looking at corals, we can do a few other things with uh, MIDAR. And with thir MIDAR-13, in fact, we can look at four different ultraviolet uh, wavelengths. This is a little sample of the Miami Beach scene that we created in the lab. Very rudimentary, but you'll see a lot of marine plastics in there. And what's exciting is under MIDAR, this is kind of a, a quick MIDAR image of that, you'll notice that a lot of those items are lighting up spectrally very brightly. So we can, for example, in the middle, detect uh, small pieces of plastic that have been biofouled, as well as different types of plastic chemistries. And we're continuing to work on this technology to detect not only coral diseases, but also some of the pollution we're putting into the, the ocean environment, particularly anthropogenic uh, marine debris, such as plastics, which are notoriously difficult to detect because they get covered in living things, as most things in the ocean do. And then spectrally, they start hiding, right? They start looking like, like seagrass or algae when in fact there's something that poses a, a quite a potent um, health risk to the animals that are in the sea, as well as the people that depend on those animals for fish protein and one other things. So it's our, our goal to try to advance this technology to, to look at that problem at scale. And I'll be leaving this weekend for a joint uh, NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency, um, meeting on marine litter to try to see if we can do this from orbit, we can do this from aircraft and over large areas and get a handle on where this pollution is, the, the intensity, severity of the problem, and then also how to mitigate the sources and sinks that are in the environment to you know, prevent the plastics from getting into the ocean to begin with, or knowing where they congregate and you know, their mechanisms for decay and how to remove them. So finally, I'll just share some of the new technologies that uh, I've been branching out into. Um, one of them is a project that I had with a colleague in at Stanford um, in California in the Monterey Canyon, trying to use fluid lensing to look at whales. This was a project that actually won an NSF award, but I was at NASA, so we couldn't necessarily <laughs> do the award. But now, you know, uh, we're looking forward to, to expanding upon that. Uh, and we just came back, uh, that's my student Cam with a um, drone landing pad that he made for the back of this vessel. Um, launching and landing are, are some of our smaller aircraft uh, to look at cetaceans using fluid lensing. And it was just one of the most uh, exciting uh, applications of the technology because for so, so long I've just been mapping seafloor, seafloor, seafloor. Meanwhile, we live in this, this rather special era of giants. You know, and not many folks realize this, I didn't realize it, but you know, blue whale is the largest organism to have ever lived on our planet. Uh, close to 300,000 pounds. They've only been around a few million years. Um, and it just happens to coincide with when humans were around. And I just think, how special is it that we get this opportunity to look at this charismatic megafauna um, like no other species did? Um, and wouldn't it be such a tragedy if we continued hitting them with vessels and losing these precious creatures um, without, you know, any thought. Uh, so I'm trying to use some of these technologies beyond looking at seafloor mapping and, and uh, marine plastics to create an early warning system from aircraft or satellites for where whales are uh, and you know, how big they are, what they're doing. So we can maybe alert vessels before they enter an area like a shipping channel to avoid striking one of them, which is what some of the main causes of death of these large cetaceans in California or to just help conserve them and you know, shield them from unnecessary human influence. 
Um, just to share some fun footage, uh, this was a, a cool lunch feeding event we got with um, the food lensing system. These are two humpback whales coming up and swallowing lots of anchovies. Quite a heady aroma if you're in the boat next to them as they clean their bay leaf. And then uh, I'm excited to share a pre-publication um, preprint of um, a fluid lensing result for one of the humpbacks that uh, were tagged using these little suction cups um, and simultaneously imaged with fluid lensing. So this gives you an idea of, of what I'm hoping the technology can do is again to get a clear view of what's under um, the sea surface. So this is the first time a humpback's been imaged um, and actually ID'd just using its dorsal features uh, from an aircraft without waiting for it to surface. So imagine, you know, trying to do marine mammal conservation without having to wait for that precious tail fluke to see the animal's tail and then look up who it is. Uh, we're getting to the point where I think we can do this from aircraft at scale, uh, automate the process, and then also, you know, not really have to get up and close to the whales uh, to really make that measurement. So this is something that continues to evolve. It's really just a prototype effort but we're hoping um, we'll start bearing some fruit next year and the year after. And then uh, further on the horizon, there is that MIDAR instrument also looking at whales. Um, and we tested that in, in this particular campaign to see what they look like in the blue and, and more ultraviolet wavelengths. Uh, another thing I'm, I'm really excited about is further trying to decarbonize a lot of the work that we're doing. Uh, marine science is, is interesting because it, <laughs> It seeks to conserve the ocean world, but at the same time, its carbon footprint is truly massive, right? From the vessels we use to the aircraft we use. And as part of my lab here, every step of the way, we're trying to develop partnerships and, and enabling technologies to decarbonize that footprint to make sure we're not contributing to that problem. And so one of the newest additions um, to my lab, you may have seen it at Rosensteel, is a flying research vessel. This is a fully electric um, carbon fiber. I think of it as more of an aircraft than a boat that relies on underwater hydrofoils and a very efficient electric motor to propel this vessel more than 40 nautical miles to support all of the coral mapping work we're doing for NOAA and the National Marine Sanctuaries, as well as NASA projects and National Geographic projects. So if you're ever at Rosensteel, I encourage you to come take a look at this vessel. Um, it's sitting here now, we're integrating new instruments onto it. Uh, and then hopefully come out for a ride sometime. We're going to also be starting an outreach program and trying to motivate the broader community to look at decarbonization, not just of what we use on land, but crucially what's in the water. And interestingly, the effects of on marine life, right, are compounded because not only do you remove the carbon footprint of the work that we're doing, but you also remove the noise and the fuel and the oil discharge that's in the, the water. Um, this is again the vessel flying by there. You can kind of see the, the front and rear wings. So at the beginning of my talk, I, you know, I painted a bit of a grim picture, <laughs> but I'm hoping that that picture is motivating for a lot of folks here. And many of you, of course, have contributed immensely already to this um, solution. It is changing, you know, the, the landscape of things. We have continued to learn more about our celestial backyard and the universe at large, I think, than we have of our seafloor. But I see a lot of progress in, in fixing that gap and trying to ensure that our world doesn't turn into something that looks like Mars uh, further down the line. And that really comes with having some knowledge of the system and learning how to protect it. Uh, I'm excited about a few pro new proposals we have in review. Uh, one of them called Project Cerulean would be a National Geographic effort to really expand uh, the fluid lensing reach and to continue this capacity building model we've done in Guam, where we train 25 local pilots. They're now equipped with their own drones and, and aircraft systems, and they can survey their reef on demand. This was instrumental after Typhoon Mawar hit, which was a Cat 5 uh, hurricane in, in Guam just this summer. Um, they were able to rapidly deploy the aircraft we gave them, survey their reef and damage, and then assign um, assessment and, and mitigation um, resources to fix that issue. So we're looking to really take this to the next level for the next four years um, and develop the capacity building model in five different ocean basins with six international partners. So stay tuned on that, and uh, I'll be doing a few more campaigns before then, but hopefully that'll be the, the year this really, really takes off. Uh, if you're interested in learning any more about some of these technologies, particularly the technical uh, <laughs> back end of how this all works, I encourage you to check out um, an exciting new publication called Oceans Across the Solar System and Oceanography 
you can scan that QR code um, or just take a look at your local library. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And I also just want to thank my team. You know, a lot of this couldn't happen without them. And you saw some of them on that slide, but the, uh, the team is growing. We have uh, three new PhD uh, fellowships opening up uh, next year. So I encourage any students to apply. I'm also uh, have two new positions that are staff positions that will be solicited uh, shortly. Thank you very much. Babe, thank you so much. Uh, this was fantastic. And we do have some questions and comments. There was an example of fluid lensing using uh, digital globe imagery. Are we able to upload our own images for processing? Ah, yes, this is a, this is a question I get quite often. Uh, unfortunately, no, uh, I used to try to do this, but there's very specific requirements for how fluid lensing works. It does not work with push broom satellite imagery like that from Digital Globe. Um, so that those are all kind of ruled out. The fundamental physics requires a very um, complex setup uh, to, to get that imagery properly. But we're looking at creating kind of basic versions of fluid lensing that work, you know, with more uh, commercial uh, sensors that are available. We piloted that in Guam and that's kind of going through the, the stages of technology maturation. And then I'm also looking at more advanced implementations, which will unfortunately make fluid lensing a little more complicated technically with the addition of radars um, to measure sea surface topography, but is really kind of where the future of that technique is going to go. So uh, yes, I wish we could process everyone's data, but sadly, it's, no, it's, quite, it's quite specific requirements. And I encourage you to check out um, the publication I referenced or any on the NemoNet website that kind of give a, a more detailed technical overview of, of how the technique works. Great, and uh, related to fluid lensing, we have another question. How long is the dwell time needed to achieve fluid lensing? Oh, that's a great question. So um, oceanographers like to do things sometimes a little lickety split, not all, <laughs> but some of them want uh, you know an image quickly. And as an astronomer, one thing you learn is the universe doesn't work at lickety squick time scales. You know, it says you need to look at me for a long time to glean my secrets. And really, we need to start thinking about the ocean the same way. So in terms of dwell time, this is how long you look at something, a sensor looks at something, right? The longer you look at something in astronomy, the more photons you get, the deeper you can see, um, the older you can see in the case of looking at light in the universe. In the ocean, it's really no different. The longer you look, the more photons you can gather from the deep, the more robust the fluid lensing solution is for things like wave breaking, um, looking through really challenging distortions, or in the case of like breaching humpbacks, you know, being able to look through and see what's underneath the humpback when it's doing something like that. So typically for our campaigns in Guam, the ones that I shared with you, uh, where we're surveying using aircraft, uh, drones for large reefs, the dwell time is only about a, a couple seconds. Uh, integrated, it's, it's less than a second. Um, so that's you know considered quite fast if you're like an astronomer. Uh, most astronomy images start at the multiple hour <laughs> point. Um, and so really what we, you know, if you wanna see deeper in the column, if you wanna see through more robust fluid distortions, we're trying to get to much longer endurance uh, sensors, things like, I didn't share in this talk, but I've been working on a, a high altitude solar drone that can fly for three months at a time. Those things are ideal, right, for sitting above an island and looking at everything that's there, so mapping the entire uh, island and its reef down to the edge of uh, the photic zone. Uh, right now, the Guam results, you know, reached a new fluid lensing depth record of about 65 feet. That's deeper than most satellites can see, including Maxar. Um, and we were looking to push that with this year's results and even further, but that usually requires a bit longer dwell time. So from one second going up to three to five seconds, but again, you know, a few seconds in the air compared to hours at sea or days, right? Trying to survey that same area acoustically or through other means, I think is, is well worth it. And I think it's something we should, we should continue to push for in the field and learn from our astronomers, uh, brothers and sisters, how, how you do this, right? How you use remote sensing to look at something that's dark. So I hope that answers that question. <laughs> Great, thanks Dave. Um, we do have a several more questions coming in and I'll just uh, remind everyone that all attendees are muted. So if you do have a question, just pop it into the question box on your control panel on the right side of your screen. So the next question we have is, 
Do you have any ideas on reducing the carbon footprint from the computing power needed for the AI? I am also doing AI research with fisheries, so it's on my mind. Yes, uh, it's a bit of a dirty secret, you know, that the amount of compute time it, it requires uh, and money, right, to do some of these big operations. Increasingly, data centers are, you know, they're, they're all about efficiency and they're moving to things like putting their data centers in cold places. Uh, for better or for worse, it certainly reduces the cooling bill. Uh, my, na my last NASA center had uh, a modular supercomputing infrastructure and, and setup that was quite clever in how it used uh, water systems to, to cool um, the AI centers, but it's something we're going to have to also start thinking about beyond the, the carbon footprint of the physical work, right, is, is that computing footprint, how, how do we do that effectively? A lot of it just comes down to the energy source, right? If you are in um, Iceland uh, and you've got geothermal energy, then you can, it's a great place to set up computing systems. It's cold, there's an endless source of, of renewable energy right underground, and it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it doesn't make sense necessarily to put a computing center in the middle of a busy city, right, where all that heat has to also go somewhere. Um, when I was doing a lot of the computing in the early days, my house had no insulation and no heat. And so I would run the computing system at night and stage the scheduler to run at night so it provided passive heating for the house. And then I sort of became dependent on making sure I had enough computations to run every night. So things like that, where you start thinking about integrating them into, into infrastructure, right? We're already, we produce heat in so many ways. Um, and then, you know, computers just use it as a byproduct. So integrating some of that, I think, are ways that can become more efficient. And some universities are even looking at integrating those compute nodes into their HVAC system so that they don't have to pay for excess heating when they're already paying electricity. So I hope that answers that question, but I think there's a lot more that, that should and could be done. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, related to computers, we have another one. Uh, you mentioned needing supercomputers to process fluid lensing data. How feasible do you forecast it being to transfer fluid lensing process te techniques to more accessible computing ability, i.e. desktop computers? Yeah, so the fluid lensing simulation work, I should point out, was done on supercomputers. The actual fluid lensing solutions can be done on a, on a desktop. Um, which I'm trying to shrink that down, you know, to the point of something like a cell phone. Um, most, you know, modern um, smartphones have the technical processing power to do it. They have GPUs, CPUs, large amounts of RAM. Uh, right now, fluid lensing works best on kind of a, a multi-core multi-GPU setup, um, but it's certainly already within the desktop realm and, you know, hopefully working with NASA to create a kind of a pathway for commercial uh, system that could be, you know, free or, or nothing for, for research purposes. Great, thank you so much, Bade. Uh, we have so many questions coming in and so many, um, so much kudos coming in for you. I'm trying to process them all and see what's here. <laughs> Um, we've got, all right, let's see. Next question. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment briefly on HIMARC, I think I pronounced that correctly, HIMARC, and the potential for satellite observations using this technology. Yes, so uh, satellites are, again, the, they're that great um, large-scale synoptic view of the planet. And everything we've, we've done on land conservation has really been informed by things like the Landsat program. A sustained land imaging program we call it um, at NASA. We need a sustained marine imaging program and there has not been one. Uh, it's particularly interesting to me because the majority of the surface is ocean and not you know land and when I made this point at NASA a few times I was told to go work at NOAA and I was like okay well now I'm straddling both and I, you know I still think if you're trying to study planet Earth you need to first study the water system and then study the land system, right? If you were a physicist, that would be the order of operations. The thing with satellites is right now for food lensing, so much of the data um, come from these remote islands that a lot of the satellites are not being turned on to look at. And then the second is that when they do look at them, because they're these remote islands in the middle of ocean basins, they are covered in clouds. And so as good as a satellite is, you know, in the optical, wavelengths, it cannot see through that cloud cover and aircraft sort of 
rain the day. Um, and so right now, you know, a lot of the funding and the, the motivation from the scientists I'm getting is an airborne sensor is still the way to go because it can be electric, it can be deployed quickly on demand, and crucially, it gets sub-centimeter scale results if they need that. A lot of people are comfortable with just five centimeter results for, you know, large, large islands. Um, but it's still filling in that, that cloud cover gap as well as, you know, um, just the cost gap, right? Sending up the satellite mission, even a cheap one, is quite expensive. Um, and then you really need a large constellation to look at everything. It's not to say, you know, we won't get there with fluid lensing, but the resolution certainly is, is an issue. Even from low Earth orbit, you know, with small satellites, that resolution is going to be limited to, you know, maybe a meter at best or half a meter. Whereas with aircraft, we routinely get, you know, sub-centimeter, you know, up to the, the 10 centimeter level. So, you know, I see pathways for both. It's really up to the funding agencies and, and the appetite they have for these kinds of things. Certainly satellites have gotten the lion's share of money, but if you're one of these smaller nations and you're looking to create a system, then not spend, you know, $150 million or a billion dollars a year for things like Landsat, then aircraft, you know, really present a sweet spot um, for, for getting that data effectively. And then also, those countries have a lot more sovereignty over that data than, unfortunately, a lot of the satellite data products are produced. Even though they're free, you know, the, the bottleneck for downloading something like Landsat data from a NASA DAC is just so, you know, the threshold is so high that many um, developing nations don't have the technical capacity or just the patience to, to do it that way, right? Whereas the model we're doing with aircraft in those, in those regions is showing they get the data immediately, you know, they send it to us, we process and send them back a result. But then they're able to, you know, make those decisions themselves. They have a lot more faith in the result because they helped generate it. Um, that whole issue of sovereignty kind of comes up a lot, um, and it also, you know, engenders a, a bit more trust in terms of like, you know, the West kind of saying, "This is what our science is saying." Here, these countries have, you know, been stewards of these resources for thousands of years, often longer than the duration of the countries that are telling them what to do. Um, and so having empowering them with the same tools and giving them those same assets, you know, even though they're not advanced satellites, they're things like aircraft, it goes, there's a cultural component that goes almost further um, in ensuring that that data are used uh, properly rather than, you know, a satellite image, which is kind of branded as well, that's someone else's observation. So, so we're, you know, we're exploring both. Um, it's a good question. You know, I hope to see a fluid lensing constellation one day uh, or a fluid lensing web space telescope. That would be my dream. Um, I don't see why we, we shouldn't be able to fund it. You know, if we can fund a $14 billion um, astronomy observatory looking away from Earth, um, I think we can certainly fund a, you know, a $7 billion ocean observatory looking down at Earth where everyone lives and moves. Fantastic, thank you. We've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, so the next one we have is, if you were put in charge of a program to map the oceans, whether of the U.S. or worldwide, what are the key things you would want to see in such a program? Oh, that's a great question. Um, is that an offer? I mean, I would be, I would be love, love to do that. So I would like to see, first and foremost, oceanography has the opportunity to do things differently than aerospace. I come from an aerospace background, right? And, and astrophysics background, which is predominantly led by former colonial powers. Uh, oceanography is still led overwhelmingly by uh, the minority of the population on our planet. And the ocean really belongs to us all. It's not that minority group. So in any program, the first thing I would like to see is it, engagement with all of the people that are most tied to the ocean, right? That directly depend on it, that have traditional jurisdiction over their own waters and empower them with the technologies they need and they're asking for first and foremost. The second thing, if I was gonna do a sustained marine imaging program would be to get the latest technologies that have been tried and tested and deploy them at scale. We have solutions like fluid lensing, minor, other solutions, acoustic solutions that have been surveying the ocean for a long time. What they lack is a coordination. Um, there's a bit of infighting, you know, between small amounts of resources, so people are battling each other. And, you know, another lesson I learned from astronomy is if you want to do one of these big projects, you have to look at international partnering and teaming, right? Some of these um, telescopes, the the Keck telescope, James Webb, they're all multinational 
partners. Every time a publication comes out, there's usually a list of authors <laughs> that's a few thousand deep. And that's the way it should be in oceanography, right? This is a, a truly global thing to study. It should have a global presence. It should have global representation. And the technologies and tools we use to survey it should be not limited to one particular category, not just satellites, not just aircraft, not just ships, right? You need all of these to survey something like the ocean. You need underwater robots mapping the deep sea. You need surface vessels mapping everything that's in the column, anything that's beyond the photic zone. You need aircraft that can survey everything down to the edge of that photic zone and can give you a synoptic view of the place at scale. You need satellites to give you that coverage and timeliness that you just cannot get with aircraft. So I think that would be all the components I can imagine and envision in a sustained marine imaging program. And then the final one, of course, is you need you need a good amount of funding um, <laughs> and an effort to communicate that science that goes beyond the way we as scientists are trained at doing it, right? The parachute science model, the, the one and done, you know, write a paper at model, I think is not what this needs. This needs a grassroots conservation effort akin to how we've done things on land and the best conservation stories um, are from grassroots engagement. So I hope that wasn't too wordy of an answer, but <laughs> um, great question. Yeah, I think that was fantastic. Um, all right, we have a bunch of questions coming in and we do have a, a couple of people at um, who are really interested in working with your team. So I will just say to everyone uh, whose questions that we haven't gotten to, everything uh, that you've typed in the questions box is being recorded and we will share all of that with Vade later on. So um, he can follow up with you directly and make those connections happen. Uh, so I have one more question here for you. I know we've got one minute left. Um, totally serious, very important question. You've worked with NASA in deep space and you were familiar with NOAA in the deep ocean. What do you think is cooler? And follow up question, why NOAA in the deep ocean? Why NOAA in the deep ocean? Um, I think both agencies are the coolest things I mean, I, as a kid could imagine. I think that the funding levels for both agencies, I can now say this as a formal civil servant, should be massively increased. I mean, they, the amount of science that they can do on the budget they're given is nothing short of extraordinary. And I think it would, it would be a benefit to humanity at large to increase the amount of resources that these agencies have to survey what is some of the most pressing problems of our era. Um, I, I have a sweet spot for NASA just because that's, you know, as a kid, I'm fascinated by planetary exploration, all of these different things. But I also have this amazing um, passion for charismatic megafauna, right? And the things that, that NOAA does that are often kind of the behind the scenes, like operational, you go out and enjoy a beautiful marine preserve and it's that way because someone made it so, right? It takes a lot of, of effort and seasickness and just time to do it and to do it well. And so, I, I don't know, I, I think they're, they're equally cool in my mind. I think they should be like, you know, one large agency, but that's that's not my job, that's someone else's. Um, but uh, yes, I, I, I do think both need more resources. In terms of deep ocean exploration, uh, this is somewhere where I think NASA and NOAA should work even closer together. You know, the Oceans Across the Solar System initiative that is going on at NASA headquarters is it's sort of informed by this bridge, uh, trying to bridge the knowledge gaps between planetary scientists and oceanographers, right? Often the oceanographers know all the answers to the, the questions that now the planetary scientists who are studying these ocean worlds like Europa, Enceladus, Titan are asking, either asking quite trivial questions in terms of what we know about Earth's oceans. And so again, bringing them into the same room, getting the, the planetary scientists to go on a DT submersible and vice versa so that they understand, okay, these are the same science questions, right? The universe is governed by rather simple physical laws that we know of. Um, and it gives rise to these incredibly disparate fields and, and things, but they all at the end of the day have to obey certain physical laws. And so when you go to explore the deep ocean and you do so with the hat of and a planetary scientist, you may not be thinking about what the oceanographer has learned about the same physical fundamental laws, but the, a lot of that knowledge is, is universal, right? Once you learn on Earth how to do it, it applies to going and exploring Europa the same way, right? Communicating under an ice sheet, um, understanding cryovolcanism, understanding hydrothermal vent systems. The Earth is this, this jackpot of a playground to 
go and understand those processes without the expense of sending you know, a team to Europa, which as much as I want it to be an astronaut that goes to Europa, it's just not going to happen in my lifetime, right? It's something that would require a decadal commitment of human life and, and resources that we just don't have. But we can get that knowledge here on Earth. It can help preserve our planet. And then you can crucially take that to go and explore one of these worlds and find life in a novel environment. Wouldn't that be cool? Awesome. Thank you so much, Vaid. I think your presentation has definitely shown that there's such a huge connection between both worlds. And we're so happy um, that you got to share your experience in both of them with us. So I know we've gone over a few minutes today, but thank you so much, everyone, for staying in. Um, and Vaid, thank you so much for your presentation. This was fantastic. We really appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Thank you all very much. It's been a real pleasure. And do feel free to be in touch. Uh, I may not respond quickly, but I will try. I'm heading to Broad Key right now to check on our research station.